This is going to be a fun one. This whole story is my second favorite in the world of Dark Souls. I'll leave any item description proof I have until the end, because it will be easier to simply tell the tale and then go back. When Gwyn and his cohorts sought to take the world below away from the dragons, he knew he was going to require help. Meanwhile, Seath was a dragon who was continuously mocked and repulsed by the entirety of his kind. At a certain point, Seath, with his brimming intelligence, became acutely aware of Gwyn's plotting and offered up his services. Now, it seems unlikely that Seath could actually lure the dragons into some form of a trap, or trap location, that would allow, that would allow the lords an advantage. Seath is definitely an inventor and an experimenter, so it is my theory that he devised the only method for removing the invincible scales that most dragons have, the Lightning Spear. However, despite that what he wanted most was to commit genocide against his brethren, he knew there was more to be gained. Seath truly is a genius, after all, and saw opportunities to take advantage of Gwyn. He made a deal, an illicit one. In exchange for giving the Lightning Spear up, Gwyn agrees to allow Seath to impregnate his only daughter, Guinevere. Perhaps she is not born yet, or perhaps she is. Either way, she is used politically, as women commonly were throughout history, human history at least, but same thing. Seath does not even have an interest in keeping her as a wife, however. All he wants is a child. Priscilla. Why does he want her so badly? I already mentioned in a previous video that the lords, including Seath, never got along all that well. They simply joined together to take out a common foe, the dragons. Seath, like the others, wanted control as well. Being the experimenter he is, I would wager that he genetically engineered the pregnancy so that she would wield the life hunt ability, she being Priscilla. He may never even have been intimate, as it were, with Guinevere, but rather saw her body as a means to grow his, gen his genetic experiment. Now Priscilla is another story of utter sadness. Unfortunately for her, Guinevere wanted, Guinevere wanted little or nothing to do with her, a forced birth and a freak of a child. And at the same time, her father went mad conducting his research. She was hated by the lords around her, since she seemingly was created to destroy them. I do not know who Aram Aramaeus is, Aramaeus, whatever, but it would seem he is capable of creating abstract worlds and paintings, and then also creating keys to access these worlds. If you ask me, Ariamis was the one person sympathetic for Priscilla, and he gave her a place to hide and be safe. Where does that leave Guinevere and her younger brother? Well, the princess continues with her life for a time, but eventually flees Lord Ren when, by marrying the flame god Flame. Who is he? I don't know. Sounds like just another guy who is a lord's soul. Or a soul. The son, however, Gwendolyn, has a whole strange story all his own. He was born last, and definitely after the dragon annihilation. What's first peculiar about him is his size. He is human size, and not a giant like the rest of the lords. Now, Gwyn is this way as well, but that is because his power is all but diminished. We know that Gwyn used to be quite large, as the coffin that Gwendolyn guards is large as well. My guess is that Gwendolyn's mother was human. Why a human? Because, because Gwyn was hoping to reverse the ancient legend of the Dark Lord. He would infect their race and create a Sun Lord, or something along those lines. Perhaps, even if his child was the Dark Lord, or the supposed Dark Lord, he would be able to uh, subdue or kill him if they found out he was going to or attempting to take over. Now, I have no proof of this, but it's a cool theory. Regardless, Gwendolyn is born strong with moon magic, a primarily female trait. This could also be because his mother was human. Who knows? What we do know is that Gwyn decides to raise him as a daughter, and apparently that makes him wholeheartedly loyal. After Gwyn is imprisoned in the kiln, Gwendolyn takes up takes it upon himself to protect on Orlando, the Lord's way of life, and to trick, trick the upcoming Dark Lord. He even goes as far as to create an illusion of his long-lost sister, and, it, and is in control of the two covenants. All his words and offers are to get the player to kill themselves as kindling in the, at the first flame. So he is either powerfully loyal, or taking advantage with plans to rule himself. It would be a perfect opportunity. His father is dead, sister gone, all the other lords killed by the player. That would really only leave him to reap the benefits. Now, on to some proof. This video will end up going on forever if I list all the items, so I'll try to pick only those that are most important. Let's start at Seath's experiments and genius. 
Moonlight Butterful Butterfly Soul reads, Butterful, uh, the Butterfly Soul is a creation of Seath the Scaleless. The Archive Tower Cell re Archive Tower Cell Key reads, The serpent men who guard the prison know not the value of what they hide. In the basement of the tower are the writhing mistakes of, a, of the terrifying experiments which were conducted there. Immediately following that, the ancient tower giant cell key states, The giant cell once imprisoned countless maidens. So, Seath clearly loved his experiments and didn't bat an eye at the morality in question. Hell, did his morality need to be brought up when we already know he committed genocide against his own kind? My point is more so that he may have been trying for a while to make someone who could battle the lords and the dragons and all the uh, Cthulhu heads, as my girlfriend likes to call them, in the basement of du the Duke's archives are probably the results of those experiments. Failed experiments. <clears throat> as for why I believe Guinevere is Priscilla's mother, aside from the obviousness of it all, is a divine blessing description. The goddess of sunlight Guinevere, daughter of the great lord of the sunlight, great lord of sunlight Gwyn, is cherished by all as a symbol of bounty and fertility. So she's known to be fertile, or at least believed to be, and bounty would certainly mean getting the <coughs> getting great treasure of a dangerous lord killing daughter. <clears throat> Excuse me. I could list items for the origin of Priscilla, but I admit that none of them are actual proof of my explanation of her story. It all seems quite logical, however, especially since we know at least that she is a crossbreed between a dragon and a lord. Priscilla's dagger states, This sword, one of the rare dragon weapons, came from the tale of Priscilla, the dragon crossbreed in the painted world of Aramaeus. That's the dragon part, at least, but she mostly appears human and yet is large, and therefore a lord. We also know for certain that her parents were not married in any way, because her soul calls her a crossbreed bastard child. Lastly, about Priscilla, we know she was feared by the gods because of her life huntability. As her sky's description is, even the gods feared Priscilla's life huntability, and in the hands of a mortal, its power returned upon its wielder. Guinevere is definitely a real person. The Ring of the Sun Princess reads, the Princess of Sunlight Guinevere left Anne Orlando along with many other, other deities, and later became wife to Flame God Flam. So, she was real and left before even becoming married. Gwendolyn is the third child, going by the Dark Moon Blade miracle, miracle granted to those bound by the Covenant to Gwendolyn, Lord Gwyn's lastborn. He was also raised as a woman according to the Moonlight Robe description. The power of the moon was strong in Gwendolyn, and thus he was raised as a daughter. I'd like to think that Gwendolyn simply adored his father despite his bizarre upbringing by quoting the Crown of the Dark Sun description. The image of the sun manifests Gwendolyn's deep adoration of the sun. Deep adoration, sun, Gwyn's the sun lord, that makes sense. It also seems obvious to me that everyone is aware that Guinevere is not real, including even the player depending on what you collect and in what order before you try and kill her, if you do, that is. The Silver Knight Shield, which you can get before meeting the princess, states, The Silver Knight stayed behind in Andorlando to defend the illusionary goddess. Also, the Dark Moon Blade Covenant Ring reads, Gwendolyn, all too aware of his repulsive, frail appearance, created the illusion of Sister Guinevere, who helped helps him guard over Andorlando. An, un an unmaking of these deities would be tantamount to blasphemy. So, we know that the that he created an illusion of her, her guards are all aware of it and still hold their post. We also know that she was definitely real and left Anne Orlando. So why does everyone stick around then? The Silver Knights and the player primarily? Because they're protecting Anne Well, not the player, but the Silver Knights are protecting Anne Orlando. They're protecting Gwyn's throne, his heritage, in his children. The last thing that we brought up in this video is that of Gwendolyn's appearance. He is Likely create, he likely created his sister's illusion in her absence because he is small, human size, and unlikely to command the respect of those like Smoke and Ornstein. They guard her because doing so is protecting Gwyn's bloodline. Anyway, Gwendolyn has the sun on his head, which we've already explained. He wears white robes likely to tr transmit the concept that he has sorcery, moon magic at that. Then bizarrely, he has snakes ushering him around. The covetous gold serpent ring states, the serpent is an imperfect dragon and the symbol of the undead. I believe this is Gwendolyn's link to his human, probably undead mother, and to the player as well. 
This lets the player know, or hopefully tricks them into thinking, that Gwendolyn could be acting and giving instructions geared toward their best interest. <clears throat> I said that was going to be the last thing, but I did promise in my third video that, video that I would get back to my quirky theory concerning why Solaire could have been exiled. It's related to Seath, however, so I wanted to wait until it was, he was discussed. Solaire was the god of war, and in being named that, he likely cared about winning wars more than anything else. The dragons were a surmountable foe, the strongest that existed. Solaire could have been the one to give his sister, Guinevere, over to Seath for rape and impregnation. He could, he could have tricked her into a secret meeting. Then, when Gwyn found out, he was exiled. However, Gwyn could not punish Seath, for he realized that Seath's part of the bargain meant victory against the dragons. Since her brother was punished, but not her assailant, Guinevere then plans on leaving Lordran someday to escape her family. This all makes sense, everybody! Last thing, I wanted to believe strongly that Seath was never a real dragon. If you know Kingsfield lore, then Seath was simply a madman? Check. They conducted horrible experiments? Check. On himself to become a dragon? Check. However, he never became a true dragon? Check. He's the only scaleless dragon in Dark Souls, and the dragon scale states, a dragon is inseparable from its scales. Additionally, the Moonlight Great Sword states that Seath is the grandfather of sorcery. Now we already know that sorcery existed before destroying the dragons, before Seath would have teamed up with Gwyn. So, if he is the grandfather of sorcery, how can it be that it existed in a world previous to his inclusion in human affairs? Then to top it off, Big Hat Logan has some great stuff to say. If you fought him and were imprisoned, you must know Seath is a true undead, different from ourselves. Aha! Although not really. Likely what Logan means is that Seath is an undead in the more traditional sense. He lives forever, but will not go hollow. Therefore, he would be more of a true undead. I doubt he meant that he is a human with a dark sign. Though, he could have, and with the rest of my proof, it all fits into a wonderful theory. Hell also makes the impregnation of Guinevere all the more explainable if he is matching, albeit likely deformed, parts. Regrettably, as much as I consider all of this proof, it just doesn't quite fit, fit into the Dark Souls universe. You would think that this would have been mentioned officially with some item or dialogue in the game. And that'll be all for this time. Thank you again, everybody.